Oh, there is some announcements. There is a lost wallet. I mean, we don't know where it is. If you find one, tell Dredge or Claire or me or anyone. Say, I found it. At 6 p.m. there is a reception next door at Jam Factory for conference delegate delegates to enjoy the glass show together. That's nice. Also, for your um, enjoyment or bother, there is a Fringe Festival opening parade tonight. It will be amazing to watch, but if you're trying to cross the city, it could be annoying. It's going to go from King William Street, uh, North Terrace, down King William Street to Tandania, which is Victoria Square, the middle. Okay, has everyone got all that? Let's move along. Oh, 8.30, 8.30, good. So now, welcome to the artist talk presented by Tobias Mool. Many of you will have seen the great demonstration this morning by Tobias and his wife, Trina Dribsholm. Okay, um, a, a great glass blower in her own right. Tobias is very unusual in studio glass in that he completed a traditional Scandinavian factory apprenticeship. Wow. As a glass blower in prosperous and productive 1989 at Holmgard in Denmark, passing his master's exam in 1992. Wow. <laughs> I hope we will hear more about that. It sounds really amazing. So anyway, Tobias gained experience working in various Danish studios until 1995 when he undertook a masterclass with Lino Taglia Petra and Keiko Ongaro. Tobias worked with Lino again in 1997 and 2000. Lino must have been delighted to have such a skilled student. In 1998, Tobias and Trina opened their own studio across the road from their house and around the corner from Abeltoft Glass Museum. What a blessed life. Right place, right time. What a guy. What a piece of luck that Tobias's work is appropriate for the theme of this conference. Addressing lightness and darkness, optical mod modulations achieved through subtle variations of thickness and transparency on finely decorated hollow forms. The Beas's personal challenge has been to master and reinterpret ancient Phoenician techniques in innovative, expressive ways that reference Scandinavian design and nature. Give it up for Tobias. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, well, good day, everybody. I am Tobias, and um, I am very pleased to be here. Tobias, Tobias, that's the potato tomato, or potato pur, was it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm very pleased to be here, and I would like to thank the Oscars for inviting me here. Uh, this has been a great opportunity for me and my family to actually come to Australia. Um, and. Um, We've actually been here for a month now and traveled around and we've had a great time here. I have to admit that um, coming from a small place like Denmark, it took some overwinning of our different fears from everything from spiders and snakes and scorpions and 4X and sharks and whatever is out there that can uh, kill you. <clears throat> but um, we are alive and uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, now, since I am from the other side of the planet, basically, I thought that um, I would take the opportunity to show you a little bit about what goes on in Denmark, what it looks like where I'm from. I'm from a small city called Abeltoft, and um, I just brought through a few slides of um, what it looks like there. 
and we can do that. Um, now, as it is required, all Danish presentations must begin with a picture of the Danish queen, and here she is, Queen Margrethe, and her prince Henri from France. Um, you may keep seated. I will do the... Okay. Is it better now? You may keep your seats. I will do the standing up here for the um, majesty. Um, I have to admit, I don't usually pay a lot of attention um, on the royal act activities, but... Um, in fact, the royal house is what have made Australia and Denmark one happy family due to this little lady, the beautiful uh, Princess Mary, directly imported from Tasmania, and now married to the Danish crown prince, uh, who is to become the king very soon. So we are going to actually have an Australian queen. Wild. Um, and as you can see in this picture, the crown prince is really pleased about it all. <laughs> apparently, <clears throat> apparently, um, Denmark and Australia have now been uh, working on their uh, friendship in both, uh, in both uh, business and in culture, which is probably why I've been invited here, I guess. Um, now, how does this work? Let me see. Just tap it. No? Oh, I think I have to tap down here. Yeah. So, well, yeah, just to show you how far away I'm actually coming from. We were at Adelaide here at that jam factory, and now we are zooming out. And here we have to spin the Earth one half, and then we fly down. Woo, and we are in Abletoft. <laughs> what incredible computer skills my assistant has. So this is Abletoft, and uh, this is just right outside my studio. Um, <clears throat> so um, Denmark is a small country. We are 5 million people, and the whole of Denmark fits within Australia 188 times. And uh, we are uh, located in a town called Abletoft on the east coast of Denmark. As you might notice, it says, or here you can see it, it says Møl and Tlusholm on the sign. So Møl is me, and uh, Tlusholm is my wife, Trine, who... I run this place with and have done for the last uh, 18 years. Um, we've set up the way it's usually done in Denmark with a studio and a gallery together. Um, <clears throat> so for many years, all of our sellings were going straight through our own gallery. Now for a while, that has been different for me since uh, most of my work or all of my work has been sold through different galleries in the States and in London. Um, Outside our studio, it looks like this. We're based on the old fishing harbor in Abletoft. And um, um, there's not a lot of fishing going on, but it's still a nice environment and um, a nice place to be. Um, here you can actually see to the right, uh, the White House is our studio. To the left is actually where we live. Um, and here we are looking over the bay of Abletoft. This is, I have to admit, this is taking a really nice and calm day in the summer. Right now, there's probably uh, ice on the water and uh, a lot of snow. This is taken from inside our studio. And here we see the, the couple uh, working in peace and harmony. That's, <laughs> that's also taken on a, on a calm day. Um, and um, this is what the studio looks like. Um, this is actually our second attempt of a studio. We, uh, the first one, um, we built it um, 18 years ago, and this one is about six years old, and we made sure that it was made uh, right this time with uh, good lighting and um, uh, space and ventilation. I just put in this one to brag about my fancy glory hole door. This is a, a, a pneumatic glory hole door that works as a camera lens, and it is awesome, and you can buy that for money. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, Abletoft. Uh, this town is about 750 years old, and um, most of the houses uh, are probably from the 1500. This is uh, uh, downtown Abletoft. There are newer houses too in Abletoft, but sort of the center is very well preserved. Um, the streets look something like this. <clears throat> coming from Europe, it always um, strikes you going to an, a younger country that there's uh, nothing that looks old. And on the other hand, I think that you must think that it's really weird that we live in these kind of hobbit homes, but these are actually uh, uh, popular and nice homes to live in. 
A round table tuft looks something like this. Um, actually, I think it's one of the nicest areas um, there is in the country. Uh, it's got a lot of peninsulas and small bays, and it's, um, I think it's a really beautiful place. We call this the mountains, but in fact, it's just uh, some hills. We don't really have mountains in Denmark. Um, if you don't like, I think it's very beautiful. If you don't like it, you can drive out of to any neighbor country within two hours or something like that. Um, this is what it looks like in summer. And this is what our beaches look like around Abeltoft. It's like Whitehaven Beach almost, but it's just uh, significant colder. Um, in Abeltoft, we also have the Abeltoft Glass Museum uh, that was founded uh, 30 years ago by Finn Lungo, whom you might have heard about. He's one of the pioneers in, uh, in glass. And uh, that is some <clears throat> it's really cool that we have that museum um, in our city. So even we are in a small city far away, we still have a, a window to the international glass world. And they do about uh, 10 shows a year. Um, <clears throat> it's an old part of the museum and a newer yeah, building made to it uh, recently. Um, the museum uh, also has a permanent collection with a piece of everyone's, I think. Um, there's been several Australian shows there as well and, and shows involving Australian people. Um, this one is just an overview from the new part of the building, which is uh, a show that Trina and I had some years ago. It's all Trina's work to the right and uh, one of her panels in the back. And another overview with uh, where you can see some of my uh, latest platters. Um, <clears throat> the, the museum does a lot of, of uh, different group, group shows and competitions, and I, I just find this one from 1997. This is uh, from the Young Glass show that was totally dominated by Australian glass people. Uh, Stephen Proctor came out with all of his students, and uh, they won all of the prizes and left again. And uh, here's uh, Claudia Borella um, receiving her prize. Um, so I started, um, <clears throat> I started blowing glass when I was 17 years old, and this photo is taken in the Holmgård Glass Factory, which uh, was the only existing uh, or major glass industry in Denmark. Um, it is closed now, like a lot of the other um, Scandinavian glass industries, but back then it was alive and kicking, and there uh, was a good business owning big parts of the Swedish uh, glass industry, and at one point it even owned uh, Vinini glass in, in uh, Murano. Um, I had seen glass blowing many places since at that time. A lot of small studios were popping up everywhere around the country. Um, and someone suggested that I should try to get an old fashioned apprenticeship uh, in one of the factories or in the, in the factory. Um, and I managed to do so. It wasn't actually the sort of job that I was hoping for. Um, the environment was very different and it was nothing like the hippies that I'd seen blowing glass around the small shops. Um, but I, I like the job, and um, I think I learned a lot. Um, as you can see, we're standing up working. Uh, we call that the check way. Um, and when looking at what I do today, there's not a uh, lot of the techniques that I learned back then that are very relevant to what I'm doing today. Um, but I, you know, in a factory, you move a lot of glass every day. You probably move a, a ton of glass every day, and you have to do it fast. So I think I got a lot of uh, ground skills working with glass that I'm, <clears throat> that I'm pleased to have. Um, however, I knew that, that uh, I was not going to stay in that factory uh, forever. Um, <clears throat> and um, um, I actually left the day after I passed my exam. The, the, it, it all, an, an apprenticeship like that ends with an exam where you, in this case, have to blow different items and you have to blow three of each and they have to weigh the same. And there's maestros from Sweden and sometimes from Finland that comes down and is your judge of how you're doing. And I, I managed, but I, I quit the job the day after because I thought I wanted to move on. I think another thing I learned there is um, about working in general. Um, have a drink? Do I sound like I need it? Okay. Cheers. <clears throat> um, I think I learned about working in general. Um, I think I learned that work ain't necessarily funny, uh, but someone might have to do it anyway. Uh, so I think I owe my sort of working moral to, to that place. Um, I was very keen uh, to learn more about glass. And one of the places that showed me that there was a lot more to glass blowing than what was going on in Holmgård 
were this place. This is the Rosenwald Castle that was built in 1606 by Christian IV. It's placed in the middle of Copenhagen. This guy is Frederick IV, who was the king of Denmark from 1695 to 1730. And um, as a young prince, um, he was studying in Italy, in Florence. He made a he met a very beautiful lady that he fell in love with. And uh, unfortunately for him, he was called back to Denmark where he had to marry the German princess. That was a, a marriage that was known not to be a very happy one. And um, in 1708, he tells his wife, the queen, that he's going hunting in the south of Denmark. But in fact, he's going on a seven-month-long trip to, to back to Italy. And of course, he goes back to Florence to see about his uh, old sweetheart on uh, much to his disappointment, he discovers that she's now a nun in the monastery. <clears throat> he does manage to meet her, but, but uh, all she can tell him is that now her heart belongs to God. Disappointed, of course, but, um, but now it gets good, because now he goes to Venice. Uh, it's the carnival season, and he's uh, celebrating New Year's there, and he's very welcome there. He's given a lot of gifts um, by the Venetian government, uh, or the Venetian um, yeah, government, and among those, there are some very finely crafted uh, glass items that he's very fascinated about in such a way that he, on the 16th of January, goes out to Murano. It's described in his diary how he leaves early in the morning in Venice and is met by a family called the Bigalia family in Murano. Um, and he gets the full tour of what goes on in Murano. And he sees everything from um, pearl making to uh, mirror making, beads and different kind of cupware and stemware making. Um, and he buys a lot of glass, and uh, he brings it all back to Copenhagen. And if you ever make it to Copenhagen, uh, I think you should come and see it. It's uh, installed like this in the castle. <clears throat> it's, um, it's put up like a treasury room, and then that makes it a little difficult to see. It also has um, glass thickness, so everything is behind windows in sort of an aquarium. Um, but there are some incredible pieces in there, and I've spent a lot of time looking at those. There are these kind of cups. Uh, some of them are up to 50 centimeters high, um, very complicated, as you can see. Um, they are just like this. There's an oval version of this one, which I absolutely love. I couldn't find a picture of it. But it's similar to this, but oval and has an oval, perfect fitting lead. I have no idea how that is, can be done. Um, there are cups like these, um, very small, actually, almost like schnapps glasses. Um, but still very delicate and very fine in the reticello. There are these well-known reticello plates. Uh, some of them are up to 60 centimeters in diameter and contains more than 360 canes. Um, <clears throat> and all of this is something I've spent a lot of time looking at. I think it's very fascinating and funny in a tickling way to think that there were people 300 years ago that um, blew glass on a level uh, which is more or less unreachable for most of us today. Um, in 1997, um, I was accepted to a class at the Pilcher Glass School, um, and the legendary Lino Talia Peter was teaching there. Lino has later uh, become the greatest influence on my work, and on my career, and uh, I think I owe him everything. Lino was uh, teaching uh, together with his brother-in-law, Keko Ongaro, who had been a maestro at Venini for all of his life. And he was, um, <clears throat> he was a, an expert in rolling up canes and bubbles. Uh, he could do that like spot on every time. Too easy. Um, um, there was a lot to look at. And uh, I think everybody wanted to look. His Nadesh uh, looking, and Brian Rubino, and sitting Preston. Um, and everybody wanted see what the maestro was doing, the Stante and uh, Brian Rubino. And somewhere in there is Lino seeing, trying to see what's going on with his uh, Saturn plates. Um, <clears throat> I got to see William Morris in action, blowing big bones. Um, and I even met Stanislaw Lebensky. Um, I think William Morris is blowing something for him here. I also uh, met a an Australian, very skilled Australian glass artist, Ben Eadles, here. Um, I was completely blown away by uh, Keiko and Lino's uh, demonstrations. Um, I had never seen glass blowing at this level before, and um, 
it seemed to me that Lino had so much experience with the glass. Um, he would have an endless amount of tricks he could constantly pull off. And um, it seemed like he was uh, sort of able to jam with the glass. He was working in a very playful way. Um, and this was very different to what was going on in Danish studio glass at the same time, where uh, technically boundaries were huge. People were wearing garden gloves making glass. Um, at this time, I'd actually entered the Danish design school. And that was just when the Danish design school was changing from being uh, what it used to be, um, an arts and crafts school, to what it is today, where everybody becomes uh, fine artists or conceptual artists. It's totally fine, but I wasn't uh, doing very well in that school. Um, my desire to learn how to blow glass was met with very little understanding. Um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, my teacher would always say, technique is cheap, the old Harvey Littleton saying, you know, but he would say that as his punty was cracking. And, and what I, I think I saw here in the Pilchard um, was that maybe technique is not so cheap. Maybe technique can actually be inspiring and open up a lot of uh, possibilities. Um, and that reminded me of something that I've heard uh, from the musical world. Uh, both my parents are classical musicians, and my grandfather was a well-known pianist and composer in Denmark. And I remember visiting him as a kid, uh, and he, was, he would practice his piano every day for hours, and um, his scales as well. And I asked him, what's up with the scales, Grandad? You're almost 70. You should know these scales but now. And he answered something like, well, the more you practice your technique, the more ways you know how to press the key, and the, the more you can variate the sound on your piano, the better you can express yourself in the music. And that's um, what I felt here. And that's, I thought this translated very well to what I saw was going on here um, in Piltjok. Um, of course, the old Harvey Lilton saying makes perfectly sense. Um, we all dream about creating new and incredible and exciting pieces in glass, and that does take more than technique. Um, anyway, I left the Danish Design School um, in order to try to uh, learn how to blow glass better. Um, Trina and I got um, Set, uh, started uh, with our own business at a pretty young age. I was 25 when I bought our first house. Trina was still in school. And um, I was setting up the studio uh, while she was finishing that. So by the age of 26, we were actually established with our own studio and uh, were able to support ourselves selling through uh, our own gallery. Um, <clears throat> um, and so there were uh, plenty of, of, of opportunity for me to, to practice um, and I practiced um, uh, cups like these, and I um, practiced the, the classical uh, ways of rolling up cane um, and more cups. I think you have to be quite determined uh, if you want to be a decent glass blower. Um, I think glass blowing is difficult. Um, you know, it takes a while before you can even get the glass out of the furnace. It takes me it took me maybe a year before even my own mother would want to own anything I. I've made, and she even thinks I'm born with a talent. Um, but um, um, as I was uh, practicing and getting better at making dolphin cups, um, I was also realizing that the Venetian style were not at all within the style that I liked, the way the classical Venetian uh, style is seen as flamboyant and complex in both form and color. I was much more attracted to uh, the Scandinavian tradition, where simplicity is a key word. Um, in 2002, the William Traver Gallery in Seattle gave me a solo show. Um, and that was one of the first times where I had to put together a larger group of work. Um, and I knew that I wasn't going to be able to impress anyone in Seattle with my technique. So if I was going to have any luck with that show, it would be depending on my ability to find sort of my own voice in, in glass. Um, so I started in sort of a primitive way, uh, simply by chopping up all the cane, laying them down as mosaics, and, and rolling them up. Uh, and this is um, some of the pieces that I that I baked it, uh, back then. Um, <clears throat> so they are maybe up to 70, 70 centimeters high, and they are uh, sandblasted surface and brush polished. Um, I also made uh, this, these kind of balls. This is um, like a Reticello bowl in some ways. Um, it's a double bubble and it's sort of an over-twisted um, painting with a thick spiral on the outside that, uh, that I try not to melt out too much so it stays with the optical effect. 
I also made um, these platters, um, upstanding platters. Um, there was, a, I think, a group of seven all together. And um, <clears throat> the little image in the center was sculpted or finished on the pipe and then stuck on the backside of a bubble that then was opened up as a, as a plate to 50 centimeters in diameter. I think um, the idea was that as the viewer would approach the, the room, there would be all these different images uh, on, on the center of the plates, different shapes, different outlines, and then as approaching the piece, there would be this extra dimension of, uh, of detail. Um, we all have sort of different personalities. Um, so, um, I, um, I like to point out that I have only aesthetic uh, reasons for what I'm doing in glass. As I have no uh, theme or subject or something like that that I'm trying to <clears throat> communicate rather than my uh, aesthetic positions and concerns. Um, and I, what I do is I basically use my uh, technique and I, that I've learned and I try to use it in a Scandinavian way rather than a Venetian way. Um, and I try to keep my eyes open when I blow glass and I hope to find small details that when used in the right context becomes interesting and adds a refinement to the end result. Um, I dream about creating uh, nice and clean and simple shapes and I hope for my patents to have uh, be textile and delicate and, and um, have um, optical effects as well. Um, so a pattern like this one, uh, I'm very pleased when I find that because it has some of the, the things that I'm looking for. It's textile, it's got some depth and, and it's got a lot of detail. Um, so I'm very pleased when my research um, gives me something like this. So I, I celebrated making that in, in black as well. Um, and this whole technique of making cane, chopping it up and rolling it up again, I've, this is what I call glass weaver series. And I've made um, a bunch of these over the years and um, I have about 30 uh, different patterns that I feel comfortable about using. And I, I've just got a bunch of slides here of details and uh, some different shapes where I've used the technique. Uh, and I think I'm just going to click through them without uh, too much talking. This was a series of bowls that I did back some years ago. Uh, the surface is uh, diamond uh, cut, and which leaves that little point uh, in the bottom of the bowl. Um, I decided to show them on these stands, um, which sort of in some way emphasize that they are small, fragile shells, I think. These are some um, vessels that I did recently. Uh, they're about 70 centimeters high. They have quite a lot of volume to them, sort of American middle size. And the platter. A lot of my work I show in light boxes. Um, <clears throat> it started really as a concern of how my work would be presented. As my work is uh, minimal and has small details, it, the lighting is really important. Um, uh, and I noticed at a lot of sh different shows, I wasn't very happy with the lighting. So I decided to do um, light boxes, uh, cabinets, with built-in lights that I would present my work in. Um, and that has led to um, me making installations like this one, uh, collections as I call them, uh, groups of work that is sold in including uh, a light cabinet. Um, and that has, um, uh, it's been very challenging for me, to, uh, and it's opened up a new way of seeing it. Instead of just making one piece and one pattern, I, I sort of have to worry about how everything interacts, and that has been a, a great challenge for me. Um, in some ways, for a while, I was a little concerned about my work needing a wire and electricity to actually function, because I was starting to make patterns that were needed more and more the light from the light box. Um, but um, Actually, I just feel like I'm showing glass slides some, somehow, and, and it's sort of opened up the possibilities of working with the patterns that are really um, minimal and sort of um, 
usually live a, a more secret life, only with the, the light behind it, it sort of starts to, to work. Um, the, um, this series here is another series uh, called uh, the Black Net, and um, I've done different versions of this over the years. Um, it's, it's a color that I, I got from Lino once. It's actually a brown, and when you put that over a white, you are able to twist the cane uh, till it becomes thin as hair. That's a very challenging thing for a white or black color to do that. Um, so I roll up canes and I twist it so it uh, becomes totally horizontal. And then in this case, it is uh, with a knife or something that I've drawn the, the vertical line. Uh, here it's like a, a, a rip mole, optic mole, that draws the vertical lines. Um, and here the surface has been curled up with a tweezer. This is the trick where you uh, change the axe of the bubble. And a knife trick again, I think. Um, this is straightforward Venetian glass blowing canes and well known tricks of manipulating the canes. But um, I like to think that these look more like pencil drawings uh, rather than Venetian cane work. This is a series called uh, Nest Balls. And um, this is, um, I've done a lot of different versions of these. And um, um, this, I'm using basically all of the tricks I have. Um, cane, spirals, optics, and different way of twisting and retwisting. And it's a, sort of a very process-orientated way of working where I'm really trying to keep my eyes open and look for little details that I can follow up on and um, get something out of. Um, so I blow, I, I throw a lot of, I blow a lot and I throw a lot away of these. Um, and I think this is a, an example of, of um, why technique ain't cheap. I don't think it's really possible to, to design something like this using a computer or a sketchbook. This is very much um, a result of having hands on. A lot of times, I, a lot of in, them are built from a lot of spirals, and I try to put the spirals on really late and um, try not to melt them out so that texture uh, becomes or remains um, tactile. And also these I am presenting often in different um, a different sort of cabinets um, that brings out the details. Another series of work that I've been doing lately is, uh, it's still the glass weaver technique, but this time I'm using a little bit of color. Um, and the color um, gives me, so I'm, I'm trying to use the color in a way where it doesn't take away the, the graphic design from the, the piece. Um, and the color opens up something else. Um, all colors melt at different temperatures. And uh, so when you have a piece like this that has blue areas and uh, gray and clear areas, um, once you start blowing up the piece, the blue areas will eventually stretch more because they have a lower melting temperature. And that makes the surface very bumpy. And it gives a uh, uh, a very nice optical effect to the pieces, I think. And so it's a little bit like if you're looking in water or over water. This is another series. This is uh, it's called a uh, twill. No, wait. <laughs> silk spinner. That's what I call them. Um, a silk spinner is a spider that makes epic spider webs. And um, this is uh, playing around with uh, white cane. And um, I've sort of noticed that I like very much when twisted cane, a motion of cane, um, meets another type of cane or when 
cane fold, for instance, or when clear glass is cut onto cane, cane has to move in a sometimes an interesting way. So it's um, this is a lot of times it's uh, rolling up canes on a solid and then folding, folding in different ways to to look for interesting hairdressers. This is a little bit the same uh, technique, um, but here, this is called black twill, and here I am uh, looking for for patterns uh, or the caning to do something that doesn't look uh, too precise or um, doesn't look too graphic. I'm looking for patterns that looks like they maybe could have grown in nature. Um, <clears throat> So every time uh, the pattern gets too precise, I, it, it won't work for this. It, it has to look like it could keep growing. Um, this is actually the piece similar to that, that we made today for the demo. And I make little, I make installations of these uh, pieces. I um, I show them again in light boxes. Um, I think the tallest uh, of the vessels would be 80 or 85 centimeters high. So these installations are quite large, and. Um, I like them to look as maybe leaves or bushes or trees or the different versions of this. These are some cylinders that I've done recently. Um, it's like an encounter piece where the, the color is only in the bottom. So the color won't actually interfere with the with the patterning. Um, the surface is uh, cut, I'm a cut on the outside, and uh, then it's brush polished back to almost shiny. Uh, platters is something that I've enjoyed making for many years, and these are uh, some pretty old, probably 10 years old pieces. Um, <clears throat> I've always found that for a show, it's really nice to have something that you can present present low uh, on the floor. Everything it tends to go out on the wall, and um, so platters are usually they work well uh, for the setup of a show. I always wanted them to be much bigger um, than I was able to blow, and um, lately I've started to fuse and slump uh, platters. Um, I would like them to be really big. These are about a meter in diameter, but I'm sort of trying to get them much bigger so they get more of a sculptural effect. The, the issue here, or the challenge, is to find um, a pattern that, that um, can carry a big shape um, and remain uh, detailed to look at. Um, so that is about the latest thing I've done in glass, and um, this is how my presentation actually ends. So thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Yeah.
possible to say it is Yeah. Um, I, in, in fact, I'm m probably more interested in the patterning, um, and I would like the shape to be uh, as simple and as precise as possible uh, to not interfere with, with the pattern. Um, um, so I think that's why I try to make my shapes really, really clean. A lot of the oval shape, which I'm using a lot, is because that usually adds a lot to the pattern because you're suddenly seeing a double wall. Um, This one there. <laughs> um, I think on a, um, I don't throw away as many as I used to, but uh, but uh, uh, I think um, maybe I throw away uh, probably twenty percent. I think still. Uh, but it, you know, I might throw it away really early in the process. You know, I, I would um, many times it's actually during a mistake that you realize, that, oh, here's maybe a little way the cane curled that could be interesting if you if you take follow up on that. So so um, it's sort of um, it's very rare that I wake up with a brand new idea. Everything I, I do is actually crawling very slowly forward and trying to refine what I did yesterday. Really. Um, and, but in particular, those bowls, they're pretty fast to make, uh, so I can sort of allow myself to, to um, jam a little bit when I make those. Okay. I think maybe there was one. <laughs> yes? Yeah. Well, what I said is, uh, I everything I do, I do for aesthetic reasons. So, um, but the cylinder shape is also a clean shape. I know it's not round, but it's also a simple and sharp shape. I've done cylinders before. I, I didn't show them, but I've done installations with uh, cylinders before. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's a, it's still a very good and clean surface to work with my patterning on. Um, I just thought the, the the color is strictly in the bottom, and the, and when you actually see the cylinder, you can only see the the pattern. But it was a nice surprise to look into it, and then there would be a color. It's only for aesthetic reasons, really. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So. That was great. When you arrived and you said, my slides are a mess, I was really worried. That was really good. So, um, yep, entertaining, sort of snappy, and 10 out of 10. Uh, <laughs> let's hear it for Tibius again and then go do your thing. And I hope it's over there.